Over the last 10 days or so, I have been looking quite deeply into what is going on in Ukraine. When Putin attacked, I was absolutely shocked, flabbergasted. I was expecting there to be some kind of prolonged, tense standoff, some kind of stalemate along the borders of Ukraine, along the eastern border. But Putin had other plans, and as we all know by now, he entered Ukraine with a significant force. I think about 200,000 infantry or personnel total. And ever since that happened, I have really wanted to crack this one open. Because I had an initial hunch, really, that everyone was lying. And based on what I've been seeing about the mass media in the West over these last two years, I took it for granted that our media was lying. And I also expect a country as corrupt as Russia to be lying. And so with everyone seemingly lying, then what is the truth? And this is something that I've been really taken by this inquiry over these last 10 days or so. So I invite you into an inquiry with me over these next days and weeks into what really is going on. Because there is, I would say there are roughly, yeah, two views here. It's the Western view, which is also the Ukrainian view, or at least the Zelensky view, that there is an unprovoked attack by Russia from an evil kind of Hitler-like a madman. And then there is the Russian view that we don't hear much about, but it's a very different view. And it seems to be almost entirely uh, colored by Putin's inner world. So who is this enigmatic, uh, enigmatic secretive man that seems to be such a chess player in his mind? He doesn't seem to be an emotional person at all, apart from perhaps when he has some sort of nostalgic, um, romanticized remembrance of the motherland as, uh, as it used to be. I know that he is somebody who sees the breaking apart of the Soviet Union as a geopolitical tragedy of just unparalleled proportions. So he's clearly a romanticist. And I feel like I understand this kind of trapped in your mind romanticist. I've known a few of them. And uh, my, even my father had some of those traits. So this is interesting to me to see this 20th century balance of power politician that has this melancholy almost for a world that no longer exists and that seems to want to revive it. And then we have the West, which, well, we are rightly criticizing Putin for the attack right now. There is a lot of uh, tragedies that are playing out. Though I don't know exactly which ones they are. I, I really don't, because so many of the big stories, the sensations that have come out in the West have already been debunked as virtual reality. The Snake Island incident, where you have the Slava cruiser that bombarded the island and just leveled these Ukrainian heroes, not what happened. They actually took the Ukrainians, fed them, gave them water, and as far as I understand, have by now sent them home. I'm not entirely sure what the epilogue was. But yeah, there wasn't a slaughter of these Ukrainians. It appears like the ghost of Kiev doesn't even exist. This ace fighter pilot over Kiev. Uh, it appears that um, this tank that just crushed a car. Uh, it wasn't even a Russian tank, it was a Ukrainian tank. Every Russian tank has a white Z on it, and this tank didn't. It was a malfunctioning tank. It was an accident and nobody got hurt. This kind of information is already starting to come out in fairly mainstream um, news outlets, but you know, it's not the 
um, it's not the main story, shall we say, or to say, that, you know, it's, we, we, we can't expect outlets like CNN and, well, the more uh, corporate liberal media or any media that is sort of embedded into this right left political game they all seem to be trapped in the same kind of narrative but there are some channels like the one i'm thinking about now is the hill with kim evishan who's an amazing journalist and she's been doing great work to expose the lies of the western media and so I can sense that there are all of these tragedies playing out, but I don't know which ones they are because our media is lying to us. But there are tragedies, all of these people of Kiev, of um, various cities, Kharkiv, I believe one is, um, are fleeing. There was a huge explosion in Kharkiv recently that uh, was very dramatic. And um, also we, we hear that the Russians are shelling Ukrainians, and, but we're also hearing the story now, the reason civilians are being impacted by this is that the, uh, the military installations, the various mobile um, artilleries of Ukraine are actually placed in neighborhoods and rural, rural areas where civilians will be impacted if there is an attack against them. And if this is true, then this is dirty warfare on, the, on behalf of the Ukrainian army. So there are many narratives and as we in the West are a culture of outrage and emotion and as many other countries and I think that Russia, at least Putin, is more like this, more repressing of emotion, more repressing of the heart, being more calculating and then being in some kind of trauma freeze because of all of the terrible tragedies that have happened in Russia over the past century and more. Russia, of course, has been invaded by the West on multiple occasions by Sweden and Napoleon and by the Nazis and from the East by Genghis Khan. And I don't know how many times Russia has been invaded, but it's a lot of times. So this idea of having an enemy at the border is, of course, really deeply embedded into the, the DNA of the average Russian. But this outrage that seems to be spreading now, I would say for good reason, you know, war is horrible and to see one country attack another is horrible, to see these kinds of pictures that are spreading is horrible. Though I'm like, I'm wondering why there seems to be a very popular narrative right now that this is not the time for nuance. This is the time to stand for something. This is not the time to actually look into the deeper causes because there is a country invading, invading another country. So let's drop all nuance and just take up the fight. It's so, um, it's so Western. It's so Western. And I'm questioning if it's the correct way to approach the situation. Because if you have this kind of cowboy attitude of you just like, oh, I've got to fight and you don't know what's actually going on, then may you be making the situation worse and not better. Like, the interesting thing with Putin, I know he's been lying and attacking his political opponents, killing them with poison. Novichok nerve agent seems to have been a popular weapon for him. And at the same time, it seems like, for the most part, he means what he says. And when we in the West don't know what Putin has been saying for 15 years now, ever since an international conference in Munich, where he warned the West about consequences, we, we don't seem to, we don't seem to take him seriously that there might be consequences of NATO's constant encroaching on Russian borders. And I wonder if this is to some extent, because here in the West, we don't really believe that our politicians are telling the truth. When, for instance, Biden stands up and does a State of the Union just a few days ago, and he talks about the importance of strength, strengthening the borders of the United States, 
I don't think there's anyone who actually believes him after the borders of the United States have been just peeled wide open with millions of immigrants pouring across the border, creating all kinds of problems for the United States. It probably doesn't mean that if his policies indicate something else. And so we are in this political paradigm in the West where we have these emotional uh, speeches and pleas to the people and then it's not followed up by actual action that is congruent with this emotional rah-rah. So we're very familiar with politicians lying in the West. We're familiar with them lying when the West and NATO invaded Iraq on the uh, assumption, the, the, the premise that there was weapons of mass destruction there. But of course, we know that all of that was a lie. All of that was a lie. And so we leveled Iraq and uh, caused untold suffering on the Iraqi people on the basis of a complete fabricated lie. So this is kind of a mo modus operandi in the West. And then the question is, are we assuming then that uh, Putin is also a chronic liar in the same way? Now granted, he is a liar because he's a dictator and he's doing all kinds of cruel things to his opponents. But may we be seeing his inner world through a lens of Western psychology and deceitfulness from our own politicians. These are questions that I've asked myself a lot lately. And I want to crack all of this open. I want to understand the psyche of this weird, secretive, former KGB agent that seems to have no sense of danger, according to his superiors from back in the days. And um, he seems a kind of opponent, if you want to use that word, that the West is not normally used to. And I want to understand the Western involvement and why NATO and the United States has been pushing and pushing and pushing up against the Russian borders while not actually seeming to pay any attention to the warnings of the Russians. What actually has been going on there? What are the geopolitical backgrounds from, from way back and more recently? I want to look at the Euromaidan revolution, the involvement of the West in that revolution and what happened there, the extent to which it was shady or democratic. I want to look at the spiritual component here, for there is a spiritual battle here. Putin is looking to the West as a, in, in his world, in his mind, it is a completely fallen and degenerate culture that has stepped away from its Christian heritage and moved into a politically correct kind of hellscape. And so when Putin talks about the West, he's talking about it as a land of increased barbarism. And then there is the spiritual uh, st strength of the Russian Orthodox Church in, in Russia, which is very traditional and is not pro-LGBTQ rights and all of these things. And how does this meeting of worlds and sp spiritual or secular traditions impact? And what are the financial implications? What will happen to the financial um, future of the world? Will Russia be strangled through these blockades? Or are there other things moving in the world of international finance that we're not actually aware of in the West that may actually lead to the loss of Western hegemony over the financial institutions and systems of the world? Are there occult implications here that maybe go way back? Maybe we can find some uh, time to explore that as well. So this multidimensional lens is what I want to bring to you guys. And so I want to go deep here with you over the next uh, days and weeks, so probably starting uh, early next week and, and taking the time that it takes. Because our press, our politicians, our institutions are not doing a good job with this and whether that is intentional or if it's fear that they are afraid of reporting objectively what's going on because there might be reprisals or maybe they are ignorant uh, i don't know which is true but we need to really 
look at what the Western media is doing here and the way that they are completely obscuring vital information as to understanding the situation on the ground. And finally, of course, throughout all of this, my heart goes out to the Ukrainians who are suffering now and who need our prayers and prayers and support. So I hope that you choose to join me on this small odyssey over these next uh, weeks to really dig deep and understand what's going on. And I'm not a political commentator. My business is to empower men to really bring their purpose and their full selves into the world. As the founder of Reclaiming a Throne, that is what I care about. And that is the background, that is the context for this. I'm not here to bring political commentary per se. I'm here to bring a, as far as I can tell you, as, tell, as truthful as possible of a version of what's going on so that we as men can become agents of peace rather than be reactively programmed by media and politicians to become agents of war while only thinking that we are agents of peace, maybe because we have a Ukrainian flag on our profile picture or something like that. Division is war. So with more nuance, with trying to understand what is going on here, I hope to bring more peace. And then whoever thinks that this is not the moment for nuance, then just don't pay any attention to these videos and go out and fight the battle if you want. But don't be surprised if a month or a year from now you realize that you were not fighting the battle that you thought that you were. So welcome to this. I will see you in a few days where we go deeper into exploring the geopolitical background for Ukraine and what is going on there now up to about 2013 and the early stages of the Euromaidan revolution. So I'll see you soon.